Hi everybody and welcome to the video which we're calling Coffee and Property, part of a series where we intend to have discussions with various people from different areas of the property sector to take their views on what's happening in the UK property market. But before I introduce our guest, let me just remind you that Cornerstone are stamp duty experts and we've been successful in reclaiming over 15 million in overpaid SDLT in the last 12 months. But more about that later in the video. Let's talk about our guest. Today I'm joined by Murray Lee, MD of Dreamview Estates, a Golders Green based estate agency, which for those of you who are unaware is in North London. And due possibly to his age and his longevity in the estate agency arena, Murray is known as the godfather of Golders Green. And that was confirmed today when he climbed out of a limousine accomplished by two <laughs> men in long overcoats and Homburg hats <laughs> with their hands under their jackets, no joking aside. And Murray, you can regularly be found commenting uh, in the property press and discussing your thoughts on the property market. Murray, tell me a little about the No to Right Move campaign. OK. It came about from a local collection of agents. I'm, as you've already said, quite well known in the area where I work in Golders Green and four or five of the agents approached me around about the time of the first Covid in March last year and said, what are we going to do with the fees that we're paying to all these portals? Uh, and they're not listening to anything that we say at all. Mm -hmm. And the costs were well over a thousand pounds, near in some cases two thousand pounds a month. And if we're going to be closed, we're weighing out the money without being able to draw the income from it. And one of the guys said to me, you're the one with the biggest mouth, and unfortunately that can be the case sometimes. Why don't you get together with all the agents and see what we can do? Sadly, at first, it wasn't easy to attract everybody on board because some were not interested in leaving Right Move at all or doing anything against Right Move because it was their main portal for attracting properties. So we actually also approached Zoopla at the same time. So the four of us came together and we became known as the Four Musketeers locally. And we approached um, Zoopla first of all and had a very good conversation with Andy Marshall, who's the chief executive officer there, and he agreed, after some negotiations, to waive our fees for a period of six months through the, the pandemic. One of the other gentlemen, Alan Golden, was talking to Right Move in the same vein, the chairman there, Peter Bolton King, I think it is, tell me if I'm wrong, and he told him what was happening there, and they agreed that they would consider doing something. And this was probably the Gerald, uh, uh, Gerald Ratner moment. They put their foot in the mouth, as we've been talking about earlier. They came online and said, we'll give you 25% off your fees for six months, but you've got to pay them back afterwards. Well, that threw a furor through the business. I'd spotted there were pockets of other estate agents groups getting together, the main one being Say No to Right Move, so I can't claim that moniker. That was set up by a chap called Rob Sargent, who runs a 36 branch company called the Acorn Group in South East London. Mm -hmm. Lovely man. To the side of that, there was another Facebook page called Boycott Right Move and another one called um, Revolution Estate Agents 2020. And I managed to reach into three of them and said, look, this is silly. I'm here, you're there, you're there. Let's pool our resources and go together. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to think I was that catalyst. Within 24 hours, I had, I'd, I'd commented on something, on some, like I did on your YouTube, yes. on something on the negotiator, and I was swamped with messages. I, I couldn't believe where they were coming from. Right Move got the whiff of what was going on, because, of course, Rob's machine was really pushing it, and they came back and withdrew the 25% offer and said, we're now going to knock it down by 60% for the first three months, 40%, and then 20, and you won't have to pay anything back. Right. To counteract that, Zoopla then said, aha, we'll give you the six months free, but if you stay off right move once beyond, we'll give it to you for nothing till February last year. The main reason behind the movement was the belligerence of right move. And unfortunately, and, and, and fortunately for them, they are the market leaders, they are the brand. You think mm. of mints, you think of polo. You, mm. you think of shoes, you think of Nike. You think of petrol, you think of SO. You think of property, you think of right move. Mm -hmm. And you can't change the public's impression. It's too ingrained. Mm -hmm. Zoopla are pretty close second. 
but there aren't many below that, including on the market, that have the traction that Rightmove do. So I said to Rightmove, this is not good enough. If you don't come back and talk to us with better packages, better than £1,300 a month, because if Supra are offering us £700 a month, you can understand the differential, I will put my head above the parapet and say, I and my followers will leave you in October. Unfortunately, the wave of progression reached a bit of a peak. We got to about three and a half, four thousand companies, which was more in offices itself, but they go by the number of companies. I think they have about 18,000 in total, maybe 19. If we'd have got to about 6,000, I think we'd have managed to push it over the edge. The time lag between when this started in the March to the September, when we all started to get back busy again, mm -hmm. it was too late. We'd lost the impetus, unfortunately. Yeah. But I stood by my word, and in October the 1st last year, we came off of right move. And I think, for my business, that was one of the best moves we did, because I continued to save Zoopla's fees, I continued to save right moves fees, you're the accountant, you work it out, <laughs> £2,000 a month, I saved myself £24,000. Sorry. No, I was going to say, which of course represents a considerable volume of sales that you would otherwise have to have achieved to earn the commissions to cover it. And in a period when it wasn't particularly busy because mm. of the COVID fallout. During those weeks, we had discussions in the office, should we, shouldn't we, what should we do, because we did notice a downturn in inquiries. Now, we couldn't know whether that was because we weren't on right move mm -hmm. or whether it was down to COVID. So I stuck to my guns. Others have, others did, and there are many still that have never gone back to right move. And I'm proud that during the period of the time I was approached, believe it or not, by the Belfast Times of all people, to tell me one, one morning that right move shares had died by 49 million pounds, and he had put that down to me and our movement. So we did get some terrific mm. victory, victory of some sort. With respect to right move, they've got it cornered. There's a good advert for you, like <laughs> cornered stuff. Um, and in the beginning of June, we decided that we couldn't risk not being with them anymore. We'd saved a whole wedge of money. Mm -hmm. We were no better off. You're going to speak to me later on about business. We've had a chat prior. Mm. My business figures didn't get any worse, and in fact, we made a big profit. But by going back on right move in July this year, we saw the inquiries go back up through the roof. Over £2 billion a year is overpaid on stamp duty, with up to a quarter of purchasers paying the wrong amount. From millionaire developers to residential homeowners, anyone may be affected by these errors. Contact us today to see if you have overpaid your stamp duty and owed a refund from HMRC. In the middle of it, we were victorious. At mm. the end, we weren't. The, the, the corporation was far too big and we could never bring them down with the numbers. If one or two of the other team members in the group had followed suit, I think we would have knocked them off their perch. What I do know is that they've all got better deals. And this was another stick in the throat scenario. I am absolutely aware of other agents who've gone back on at better deals than I've got. Right. And I can't change that, and they're intransigent about it. Okay. We've had to, excuse the language, suck it up. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but during the course of the pandemic, we saw exactly this issue with landlords and, and vacant office buildings yes, and yes. shops, and the government moved measures to f prevent landlords from evictions to and basically help tenants out as right move as the owner of the largest piece of digital real estate in property marketing do you not think it behoved them to take a responsible attitude without a doubt david and i'm contradicting myself because i went back on but yes absolutely and all we managed to get was that little mini victory of the reduction in fees well, but well done to you because you know at the end of the day had you not done that a lot of agents would have been forced to carry on paying fees for a platform they could not use because they did not have instructions. I can tell you for a fact, and I'd have to go back through trawls of emails, I've had three or four, maybe more, thanking me for keeping his staff in their businesses. Mm. They would have had to close their... You did the numbers with me, £24,000. Yeah. How much you're paying your staff? They would have had to release at least one or two of their staff to keep paying the right move. And that was the decision that they had. Yes. Come off right move, lose a bit of business, stay on right move, lose a member of staff. Mm. So I'm very proud of that part that we did too. And 
that's why I'm here, because, as you mentioned, I've become a bit of a mini-media star, both in stature and in amount. Um, and I do still voice my opinion on where the market is. Whether I'll ever change it from my corner of the world, I don't know. Times will change. I think one of the things that the pandemic has taught us is, is that as business people, we need to be flexible in the face of Agreed. adversity. Absolutely. You know, we had the furlough scheme. Um, we've had the, the, the loans, the grants, and all the other things that have gone on. And we all know those have got to be paid back. But ultimately, it's about businesses, and particularly, I believe, the larger businesses and institutions in our, in our, in our economy and in our society, understanding, quote, we are all in this together. Yes. What can we do to help the small man? Yeah. Um, it's a shame that it had to come to a campaign in order to get somebody... But if you don't make enough noise about it, you don't get noticed. <laughs> uh, I accept that, and I think, I think, but I think you were right to do so, and I applaud you for it. Thank you. But moving away from that and drawing on your experience as an estate agent, what's your basic checklist for appraising a property? Well, the first thing to do is also make sure the person who contacts you is the person that's selling the property. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've had situations where that's not been the case, and I can tell you long stories which maybe we'll talk about off screen afterwards. Um, I first of all sound them out, make sure I know what they're looking for before I go. And then when we do go along, we take with a, our, our advert pack, our media pack with our voucher. Mm. And then I go around the house with them, make sure that it's presented as well as it can be. And many a time I've had to tell people, and it's a hard thing to do, make sure your beds are made, make sure the dog isn't in the kitchen and so on and so forth, dishes out the sink. Um, from a checklist point of view, I take with me a plethora of knowledge of history in the area. I'm very, very localised. I've started in mm. Edgware in 73, came to Hendon in 76, and been in between Hendon and Golders Green till now, which is in a total 48 years. Um, I nearly know every property in the area, so it's a self-effacing checklist, and maybe we'll talk about this later, but there are now tools available for online valuations, which I don't take any credit with at all. I, mm. I think and you and I talked about this uh, online earlier. I check the properties, make sure they're presenting well, that they've got all the right features for what they need to be, and then give them as much advice as I can of bringing it a curb appeal, which is standard stuff, obviously, mm -hmm. um, and obviously discuss them fees and so on and so forth, and make, to, make sure they know the service. At the moment, my phone's here on the floor below me. It, it's pulling at me to do things, and that's the service you get with Dreamview Estates to make sure that we're responding, mm. and this is what I will be telling them, as immediately as we can be. Yes. I mean, the temptation has been with the, with the rise of these property platforms for people to have a go themselves. Um, and indeed, I mean, you know, in my video, we, we said that there's, there's a danger you might underprice it and not realise the value. And yeah. you won't know that. Yeah. Um, and my, my late father has always said, you know, I, I could ring my late father and say, I'm on this street. Yeah. And he would say, ah, I know who built it, I know exactly the styles of properties on there. What number are you at? Yeah. Um, oh, that's a dormer bungalow. Yeah. You go, God, you're if right, I, Dad. If I can tell you, many a day I get a phone call, usually around about five o'clock, by surveyors, valuers for lenders, mm. asking for me and my opinion, and I have exactly the same rapport with them, and that's why they phone me, because I've got an encyclopedia mm. of knowledge, I can almost tell them which house they're looking at. And if I haven't seen it to value it, I've either sold it in the past, or someone else has told me about it. I've got radar eyes, I know what goes on, and it's stayed there. What I wish was, when I was 11 years old and 16 and 17, I'd taken that into university with me, because I never was that clever then. <laughs> Well, did you go to university? No, no. I left school at 17, I think, went to a sixth form college, studied accountancy. Interesting. I was top of my class in accountancy, but I couldn't turn it into exam results. Mm -hmm. I was then offered a job in McFisheries. You may or may not remember them. They were a very small supermarket group taken over by Safeways and then by Morrisons. Right. And I worked there at the weekends, and um, they offered me a managership job, and my mum said, no son of mine's going to work in a supermarket. <laughs> I've been a millionaire in shares by now, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I didn't go to university either, um, and oddly, and then entered a profession that was supposed to be graduate only. Yes, that's good. Um, yeah. And then done well. Double qualified, of yeah, course. Very but good. Uh, yeah, I always find it, I always give a lot more weight to people who are, how can I put it, uh, what's the phrase? An ounce, 
an ounce of determination is worth a pound of intellect, in yeah, my view. Yeah, I'd agree with that. You can't learn more from being out there in the streets working than being... I respect mm. the children and the students that said we've gone on to university. It's a different world to where we were at the time, but I don't think unless you get your feet wet, you can never learn the businesses. No, I, I, I would agree. I think it's, uh, you, have to walk, you have to walk a mile in on the shop floor shoes, and, yeah, and yeah, somebody's yeah, shoes. Yeah. So we've talked about your experience and your, your encyclopedic knowledge of your area, but what changes have you noticed before, or during and now after the pandemic? Interesting. Assuming we're after it, of course. Yes, but. Yeah. I mean, our area hasn't changed much. We talked off screen about where I work and the particularly inherent type of people that live there, the Jewish community. So that's not really changed very much. We did see during the late 90s and early 1000s, a big influx of overseas people, good working people who came to live here from Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. Middle Eastern Europeans, and we've noticed those have gone. Now, that's perhaps because of Brexit mm -hmm. rather than the pandemic, um, and we're not seeing some of the shops have gone. They opened up Middle mm -hmm. Eastern European shops, Eastern European shops, and so on, and they became tenants and good reliable tenants, and they became good tradesmen as well but we've still got the same core people living in our area, so there hasn't been a dramatic change. Perhaps there's been a change of the style of properties because the big demand in my area is for large houses, mm -hmm. and there was a movement towards converting into flats. Mm -hmm. That's tailed off a little bit mm -hmm. because the demand for houses is greater than it is for flats. Yes. I mean, it's interesting what you say about, we shall call them no, non-British people yeah. leaving and going home because one of the trends, I've just been out of Spain, and one of the trends we've seen is Brits in Spain mm -hmm. selling up and coming, coming back, back to the UK. And ironically, I believe that the reason for that is closeness to family, yes. which the pandemic has shown us how fragile our ability yes, to travel yes. technically is, and also, believe it or not, health services. And I'm not yes. for a second criticising the Spanish health system. No. But I think British people intrinsically feel that the British Health Service... They're comfortable with it. They're more comfortable with yeah. it. But it's so... Uh, maybe the great international uh, migrations we've seen over the last 20 years may, may to a degree, reverse. Yes. So how has the pandemic been for your business? Well, actually, not too bad. Uh, in fact, I would say from September through till the end of January was one of our best quarters ever, mm -hmm. which, considering it's the winter quarter and notoriously the quietest quarter, the demand for property was on the rise. As you've read in the media, prices were going up and, and sometimes unattainably to levels that weren't really where they were before, and we didn't see a loss in business. I would say my business is a small boutique-style business, and we were probably... 65% lettings, 35% sales, got that right, 100%. Um, and at various stages it... It seesawed. Weighed, it seesawed. Mm. It suddenly went 65% sales and 35% lettings, and that comes back to the lack of overseas people being here to rent the properties. Mm -hmm. The landlords suffered dramatically. To get their properties let, they had to make swinging cuts in the rentals, either to keep the tenants or to get vacant properties, mm. let's say, from £2,000 a month to £1,700 a month. Yeah. Was that a 15% mm -hmm. drop? Big drop in their eyes, obviously, but better to have it rented. Well, in the meantime, house prices were continuing to rise. I will scare you. The cheapest house that we can sell in the NW11 postcode in my area is around about a million pounds today. And that scares me, bearing in mind how long I've been in it and how much I sold them for originally. And flats... One, one bedroom's come in around about £400,000. Right. They haven't gone up pro, pro rata as much as the houses have, but the houses have rocketed. And to think in terms of some of the stuff, and when we meet again, you'll see the prices of what you pay. Even my wife, when we go past some of the houses, they paid a million pounds for that. Hmm. And it's beyond... But I could go back to the office today and you give me your house to sell and I've ticked all the boxes and make sure it's yours and put it on the market for a million pounds, I'll be inundated with people who want to buy it. So that has changed. There's still a demand for buying and paying higher and higher prices to stand ladder. Uh, going back to your actual question, when I get my figures out, I think we're doing better than we did 18 months previously. Oh, congratulations. It's Thank interesting, you. isn't it? I mean, and for those of you in the audience, it, Murray's obviously from London. We're shooting this in the East Midlands. Um, sometimes... South East Leicestershire is known as Greater Londonshire because of the commute times to St Pancras are under an hour. Yes, it's good. Um, 
but I can tell you now that if you were looking at a property over a million around here, you'd be getting five beds with about three quarters sure, of an acre. Sure. Um, if you go 25 miles north to Nottingham, yes. so the commute time is now over an hour, property prices are about 40% less. Wow. But that's levelled up during the pandemic because yeah. of the working from yeah. home. Or yeah. I saw it referred to the other day as WFG now, working yeah. from garden, <laughs> um, <laughs> which I think is brilliant. Well, yeah. um, Especially on a day like today. Yes, well, on a day like today, it's been lovely. But uh, I wait to see how many WFGers remain in their summer houses when the snow's on the yeah. ground and yeah. they're, they're having to wear three pairs of socks. But. Uh, Maybe we'll do a winter edition and see how we get on with that. So tell me about, what's your perception of the future of estate agency? That's a tough one. Um, we seem to have maintained most of the agencies in my area, but I have read, and I do keep an eye, a lot of agencies have gone to the wall. Obviously, they never listened to me and came off right move, um, <laughs> saved themselves some money. A lot of them have gone into liquidation, gone out of business. Mm -hmm. Some of them are being bought up again. And I see recently, if you've seen the media, there's a lot of the large chains that are being offered to the public. Chestertons are out there for a hundred million pounds, if you've got it. Leaders, Romans are putting themselves out on the market. So obviously, they now think because of the figures, and they probably have the same figures as me, because I'm not a, a mm. one-off, that they're bank balances, their, their books are looking better, now time to try and sell them. So there may be a shift that way around. What did change many years ago, maybe we'll get onto this, is the online marketing of properties, and I think that waned. I have a picture on my phone, and I believe it was posted by a chap called Russell Quirk, going back to 2000 and something. Over 50% of properties will be sold by online agents by the year 2020. Well, we're not, we can't use this to use prolific words, but that was of rubbish. <laughs> And it hasn't changed, and they've shifted back the other way. I think people want service for their money. At least I like to think so where I am. And that's why they come to Dreamview Estates, and they go to our local agents. Most of our local agents, there are two franchisees, are independents like me, and have been in the area a long time. So mm. I can only talk for locally. And they've been there through the good and through the bad. And the two franchisees are both independent guys that I know very well, and they've stuck it out as well. So it hasn't changed an awful lot, and I don't think it's going to change where we are. Globally, I think it might a little bit, and we have to talk about Purple Bricks because they did make a name. They've now changed their module. They're now employing their staff like Uber rather than self-employed. So that's mm. an interesting change of direction, which means they're obviously going to be doing something different to what they're doing because it's not working for them all the time. Mm. And I think the online model, cheap as it may be, cheaper chips isn't always good enough. You pay peanuts, you get monkeys, in my view. Yep. Well, we have a little... Uh thing we use in the office and we've got three switches you've got good fast cheap <laughs> but you can't turn all three switches at the no, same time no, no. i always uh, say to my vendors not how much you pay for your agent it's what good a service he gives you yes i mean ultimately the agents are focused on the vendors aren't they i Absolutely. mean their job is to obtain the best possible yeah. price um, can i just say one thing there though i also balance my focus with my applicants mm -hmm. because without them you don't have vendors it's a very tricky rope to walk along. But you are the broker between them, Correct. essentially. And a punch bag many times. <laughs> and you're hanging on, you've got people, you know, different views. In fact, as, as we closed down for a couple of days, as you know, it was holidays, um, I was on the verge of an exchange of contracts, which didn't happen. Right. And now I've got to balance everybody's uh, expectations until mm. Thursday, you know. So. Oh, dear me. Well, holidays, who, who could have them? Yes. Oh, sorry, yeah. I've just got back from life, so. <laughs> so we're looking at the market as it is today. You and I have both literally watched property markets all our lives. Can you see any overtones or echoes of the 2008 recession in what we've just been through, or has it been an entirely different thing? And if I so, think, why? I think it's very different. That's a difficult one to answer. Even with long experience I've got, I was shocked at how busy we were mm -hmm. and how active we were during the second return. The first one, March till May, mm -hmm. was very dead. Then May to September, we started to see it. But then when we started to get through September and it started to get back to even how busy it was, shocked me. We weren't prepared for it. Mm. There was one day I was out. I, was, I didn't go back to the office. I had a bag full of keys going from property to property and property to property and property to property and, property and, property and get the office and get... I never saw the inside of the office, which is very unlike me. Mm -hmm. I like to be back in the office to deal with those 
blooming emails that don't leave you alone. And I, I don't think we noticed a change like there will be, or I don't think we'll see a change like there was in 2008. That was more economic based, I think. Mm -hmm. Here, I think we might plateau. Having seen that as long as I have, we, we peak and then we plateau. Mm -hmm. In my area, we don't drop very much. We just stop going up. <laughs> and that's what happened in 2008 as well. Mm. There was a period when you came in and you did have to twiddle your fingers. And it has been a little bit like that, but that's caused by the lack of instructions. Once we get those, yep. the circle you, starts again. To use the phrase, you need stock if you're going to move anything Correct. off the shelves. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, I mean, what I find interesting is, is we, we developed a very early theme. Uh, we, we called it the de-urbanisation or the great migration and the people wanting to get out of the cities and get to a bit of space. Yes. And I believe last year the three most searched terms on right move were detached, garage and garden. Um, yes, I think that's right. The DGG search, yeah. as we called it. Yeah. And, yeah, I think that's been part of it. The pandemic, in, in my view, has affected the psychology of people. They want space, they want fresh air, they want a bit of sunlight around them. Uh, but will that ever reverse, or what do you think is going oh, to Oh, that's another one hard to predict, because we've never had a situation like this before to judge it on. Mm. I guess, and as I've talked to you outside before, we've had a period where we've been unable to sell flats very easily, and I gather that's pretty much countrywide, or well, certainly London-wide anyway. Mm. Um, and just stepping off for a second, I had an interesting case where a guy was renting from us, he's moved to Brighton because he's got detached garage and garden and he's mm. an hour and a half from London, paying in mortgage what he'd be paying in rent in London. Yes. So mm. that's shifted that move and that sucked out the applicants. So it's changing again and I'm pleased to, pleased to say we've agreed a couple of sales this week, one of them to a first time buyer buying a one bedroom flat, which I haven't done for a very long time <laughs> in, 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 the, in the COVID terms of long time. Uh, the other one's a bit random, they're buying for an elderly relative, but still the flat market as a whole is quite stuck and it needs something and I don't know what it's going to be and obviously we talked again about prices dropping a little bit which they will have to do the one that I've agreed to the father is 15% less than asking but at five million five hundred thousand it's still not a big drop it's know. not a huge drop no. I mean uh, I wonder and I'm speculating here is we we as well as brexit and pandemic we've got oh, a considerable number of Hong Kong Chinese with the yes, right to live here, yes, and I've all right. I've done about you, but I've already started to see inquiries. Yes, yes, we have people, and when you go, is it an investment? They're going, no, no, this is going to be their home. Yes, correct, yeah. and that, particularly because probably probably not through choice. Yes, the. Hong Kong Chinese are used to living in highly densified urban environments. Yes. It may well be that that might be, the, I'll call it the saving of the yeah, city centre yes, apartment yeah, market. Yeah, it's a very interesting market, a very interesting point. And I have noticed also more overseas and certainly from Asia contacting mm. us again now. Yeah. Things are getting back to normal a little bit. Well, yeah, I mean, geopolitically, um, I was talking to somebody, funny enough, in the Middle East last week, and there's a general perception in Asia so uh, the, there's going to be problems with China and Chinese territorial expansion. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people are, shall we say, hedging now by yeah. retreating to the West. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen inquiries from Vietnamese, Cambodian buyers. And those we haven't yet. But um, they're fairly rare, yes. um, as you can imagine. Um, sometimes, you, you know, gone are the days when we had to look upon a map where somebody was yes, from. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's been, it's been interesting. Yeah. So, talking about prospective buyers and wherever they come from, if you're looking to buy a property, what tips would you give to viewers? Okay. I have an old saying when I go around with applicants all the time. I say, make a list of 10 things that are the most important to you. Obviously, location has got to be at the top of the list and it's got a ticket. Um, condition is your second one and obviously then price. Below that you can have any of you want any ones of six others that you can have in there. I don't know each person's specifics. Individual crime. Yeah. But I do say to them if you can get to six or seven out of your ten, tick the box yourself because you're never likely to get ten, not impossible. Nine less likely and eight's a rarity. So if you can get to six or seven of your ten most important things, and I think that's about enough Mm -hmm. You can have a list as long as you like if you want to, but if you've got 10 most important things on there, you can get to all of those, that's the property to buy for you. 
clients transferring commercial property into their SIP or SAS pension have been advised to pay stamp duty when they did so. This advice is based on a flawed understanding of the legislation as proven by our experts. Find out today if your pension is eligible for a sizeable SDLT refund from HMRC. What advice would you give to people who are selling their property? What top 10 tips would you give? Okay. Well, that's slightly different to the ones I gave for the actual purchasers, different mindset bits and psyche. The first and most important is make sure you choose the right agent. Interview two or three. I think any more than that would be incorrect. You'll be swamped with many. And take diverse ones, maybe even go for one who's on the internet, see how that works out for you. Don't go by just the fees. Have a look at their track history. Go by recommendations. Speak to people who've dealt with them before. Mm -hmm. As regards the house itself, make sure it presents well. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. So curb appeal, as we call it. Make sure the house looks nice from the outside because drive-bys, even in this day and age of video presentations, still very important. Inside the house, make sure it's tidy. We're not talking country homes and gardens here. You can't keep your house perfect all the time. But if you know an applicant's coming, have a quick tidy round, get the toys off the floor, get the dishes out of the sink. Stay in the background. Don't oversell your properties. One criticism I have of some of my vendors, they tend to follow you around and uh, give their own bits of advice. If the agent wants the advice, he'll come back and ask you, which is what I always do. Be pleasant, be available. Never try and be too difficult about making appointments. You have to put your toys down if you want to play the game with other people. If I phone up now and say I've got someone who wants to come and see the property pretty instantly, subject to personal situations, make sure that you can be available the best of quality. Ideally, give me a set of keys, go out. Don't have a problem with that. If you're not there, we'll do a better job and we can come and go where we like. But that doesn't always follow. Keep in touch with your agent, but make sure he keeps in touch with you. I was sitting only, only the other day at a place recommended by somebody and the lady was complaining that her agent wasn't in touch at all. I said, then sack your agent. I try and give my vendors I won't say weekly, sometimes it's not possible, but regular updates of what's going on, which comes back to pick your best agent. Absolutely. So, in all the years you've been viewing properties, what's the most unusual thing you've seen when viewing Some of them property? are not for camera, David, I'm oh, <laughs> pleased to say. I, I can I quite imagine. A, a trainee 17-year-old estate agent when I used to go and collect sixpences out the meters for gas supplies. And you probably can't remember <laughs> that far back yourself. I can actually, you can, but can. yeah. James certainly can. I suppose one of the strangest ones is I was invited to see a house, which he did tell me at the start was a probate valuation. <laughs> Got to the house and immediately I could see from outside it looked neglected. Went inside, and the first, it was a bit strange, a bit dark inside. Went inside, the first room he showed me into, piled high with old newspapers. Nothing else, just piles and piles mm -hmm. of old newspapers. Reasonable sized room, okay. Came out, saw the rest of the house, we finished off in the back reception room. He said, come have a seat. Oh, don't sit there, that's mum's seat. I said, what do you mean that's mum's seat? There's no one here, it's your mother's house. She passed away, I was thinking this. Turned around and the urn was there. Oh, my Lord. I, I went through cold shivers. I couldn't get quite out of the house so quickly. I actually did get the instruction. I actually did sell it. And, and having the go-back conversation, please make sure the house is... That was a hard one. But sitting on his mother in the chair who was in an urn was probably one that comes to mind. As I say, some of the others might not be printable. No, I think it's interesting because my father um, was an estate agent yes. and he used to do a lot of what were known as reports on construction and valuation, yes, RCVs, yes, yeah. now done by in-house mortgage surveyors. Yes. And he used to survey a lot of properties in Leicester, and uh, I always remember him coming home one night and I said, uh, said, you know, done anything interesting today, Dad? And he went, yes, yeah. actually, he says I was doing an RCV, um, and I had to call the police. And I said, why did you have to call the police? He said, well, I've gone up into the loft to poke the knife into the rafters to, you know, look, up, look for a bit of rock, whatever, he said, and I pushed the hatch back, flicked the light on, he says, and there was a Bren gun. Oh, my gosh. I said, well, that would be great, you should have brought it home. He says, no, he says, it was the 200 rounds of ammunition it's that were sitting next wow. to it. This is about 1973, and it's wow. clearly been up there since about 1945. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody decided to bring it home from Europe and as a souvenir and forgotten there. it was there, sure. because that, similarly, was a probate sale. So, you know, you do find some interesting stuff yes, lying around. Say, some of them not really for printing. Absolutely not. So, 
we've talked about your history. You know, you're familiar with Gold as Green and, as you say, Hendon and, and I'm guessing Collindale as well yes, in that area. Yes, Collindale, Edgware. What true. are the largest changes you've seen in that area during your career? Well, first of all, actually, the industry you picked up, and we talked about this earlier, Collindale has changed dramatically. It's become a new build hub. They took apart the old Hendon Aerodrome. Mm -hmm. They demolished a lot of things. Well, and including the Hendon Police College, didn't Yes, they? that's all been sold off, or some of it's been sold off. They've kept some of it, they've retained. And it's exploded with brand new developments. And the prices, and I don't do a lot there because it's just on the edge of our area, have rocketed because they're new. But and the same thing happened with Cricklewood. There was an old dairy there many years ago that caught fire. Mm -hmm. burnt down, that was all replaced with new homes and then Cricklewood suddenly became more expensive. So the trick is to spot these when they're happening. Because how do you, how do you spot a good area and so wait for something bad to happen? And <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's changed. In my specific demographic, which is Hendon and Golders Green, very little has changed. I accepted with you earlier, we did get a lot of overseas people came in mm. during the 90s and 2000s and even more so in the run-up to Brexit and then they've gone as we said but obviously inherently Golders Green is a very orthodox Jewish area and that stayed very much the same. My buyers and, and sellers stay within probably a five mile radius of where my office is if not smaller. Mm -hmm. They all have to be within reach of their family and a synagogue that they practice with mm -hmm. and they won't go out any further than that at all. So the demographic hasn't changed greatly, only the prices. I now tell people I'm selling to the grandchildren or fourth generation, third, fourth generation. It's scary if you look back at what your parents paid and what you're paying now. The mm. question is, and you asked me this earlier, what was it going to be in another 25 years' time? I still might be working then, you never know. It'll be interesting to see what they'll be. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of talk about property market overheating and people saying Agreed. there's going to be a co correction yes, and all the rest yes. of it. Um, my own feeling is, is that because of the incoming um, overseas investors, and we talked about the Hong Kong Chinese moving in, I don't re yet believe we've reached the situation where prices um, are reaching at the point where all purchases are going to be actively discouraged, that there, no, isn't, there isn't presently an no. oversupply. The only thing I think may make a difference is the economics of it, because you're an accountant. I don't understand how people afford to pay for it. To, to borrow the amount of money you need to get on board to get, in my area, a half a million pound flat way outweighs the wages. Although I do remember when I bought my first flat for £25,000 in 1984, <laughs> I was earning the grand sum £430 a month and interest rates of 15% in those days. Yeah, you and I are on the same page on yeah, that one. I had £4,000 in the bank, mm -hmm. I got a 100% mortgage, and I managed to afford the repayments, which were about £390 a month. Mm. So you always manage to afford it, but it feels like it's becoming unaffordable. That will change the dynamic, mm. but it doesn't seem to. That, sorry, that should change the dynamic, but it doesn't seem to. But surely the dynamic is... You know, when, when you and I first started down the mortgage road, you know, you could borrow two and a half times That's your right. income. Yes. The income multiple was what was there. But as you rightly point out, we live with interest rates of 15%. Yes. We regarded 6% as being, you know, quite literally yes. bonus holiday. Yes, yes, yes. What we seem at the moment to have is with ex historically low interest rates, and I remember during the crash seeing a paper but written by Barclays chief economist saying that we were going to be with low interest rates for a generation at right. least yeah. and that was before we had a pandemic yes, yes, yes. Um, it's about affordability if you're yeah. able to borrow at 1.5 1.9 yeah. 2% then comparably you can afford seven times the price yeah. that you or I could afford yeah. 40 years ago yeah. so the, the danger is, is that we enter a period of high price inflation or, or high interest rates without the concomitant wage inflation yeah. that needs yeah. to go with Do it. Do you think we're going to get high interest rates? You're an accountant. I, I, I'm praying we don't, and I haven't heard anything that's pushing us that way. There are certain inflationary pressures at the moment, as we've, have, have, we've seen, but I think most of that's down to supply chain issues yes. as much as anything else. Um, there needs to be inflation, and, yes. I'll, and I'll explain why. If I explain why, we're currently, the whole world's in debt. The easiest way to reduce your amount of debt is to have inflation, because the value of debt remains fixed while the price of everything rises. So we'll, essentially, when you or I were buying, the interest rate factored in inflation. These days it doesn't. 
So if I could borrow £100,000 today and we had inflation of 5%, over the course of seven years, the value of that debt would be down to around 50, 55,000. Okay. So if my house price stays in line yes. and my earnings stay in line with yes. the rise in house prices, actually the amount I, real terms, the amount I've borrowed has halved, even though I've not done right, a repayment. Okay. Yeah. It's called inflating, it's inflating itself out of debt. Do I think the world's governments can risk a period of high inflation? No. I think things are a bit fragile. But we're already seeing wage increases and above inflation increases, primarily because we've got we've we've got lost all our Eastern European yeah. workers and our yeah. EU workers. Yeah. So we're seeing this. We are seeing this shortage in in various sectors. Hospitality wages are now rising. Yeah. Um, are we going to see the death of the minimum wage? That's Who knows? Yeah. Um, so that that all then has an effect on the property market. Correct. Although, as I said to you, and I didn't say this specifically, where I'm working is a bubble because of what I just mentioned a few mm. minutes ago. Outside the area, the market seems to still be exploding. If you look, in fact, again, in the paper today, they were showing how much prices have gone up pro rata everywhere. Mm. London was one of the lowest. I think yes. only 1.3%. Mm. But pro rata, the cost of London is more expensive. They don't mention that. So 1.3% in London is like 5% in Bristol, you know. Are we, you know, are we actually seeing the property market reacting in its own way to Boris Johnson's levelling up agenda? Or is, yeah. it, is it likely that the regions are going to show more growth? I think so. And has that been because of the demographic shift to working yeah. from home? As, yeah. as again, repeat, it won't affect me specifically, but areas that I don't deal with are going to be affected by that mm. for those reasons, I think, definitely. So what do you think of the medium and long term trends in, in the property market? Are, are, are We've seen buy to let and city centre apartments been de rigueur fashionable. Um, the rise of the metro sexual and all the rest of it. Do you think that's now gone away or is no, it just gone no, to I sleep? Don't think so I, I still think there's a, a good buy to let market out there if the price is right. If they can see 4% uh, return and above, it's a good investment. Below that, with all the hassle involved, without guaranteed capital appreciation, they probably wouldn't buy it. So there's a fine balance on buy to let against value for money, you know. But they're there, and I still get the phone calls coming up, and you can have this on your screen if you like. We get asked what's called a metzir. And a metzir in Hebrew or Yiddish is a bargain. And, and those you can't get because of the demand that we've been talking about throughout today. Mm -hmm. So while the prices are not inflated, but what they are, a buy-to-let buyer can't get in low enough to get them at the Bible. But they want to, because what they're going to get for their money in the bank, talking about interest rates, 0 0.5, 0 0.1%, sorry, you know, nothing. Nothing at all. Well, there's a very real prospect that if the world economy doesn't recover, we're going to be all moved into a state of Japan. And negative interest rates was something that was being talked about okay, even before the start of the pandemic. Um, you know, they want capital circulating because that's yes. what keep, keeps an economy alive. So if you had to give advice to new estate agents about the hardest lessons you learned when starting out, what would it be? That's a tricky one because I go back a long, long way and the market was very different then. Make sure that people trust you and they give you some sort of credit for the knowledge that you've got. Be honest with people, be honest with yourself. Never try and pull the wool over people's eyes because it will soon come back to bite you. I've never done that over the years and that's why 48 years on I'm still here selling properties as I said a few minutes ago to now to the grandchildren. People come to me because of the recommendations that I get and that's the most important thing. You've got to build trust, you've got to build a small brand yourself. A brand, never mind the company that you work for, you're a brand within yourself and make sure that people who get the recommendations, you get treated in the same way that the other people. Follow the same pattern, be, be solid, be static. Mm, no, I thoroughly agree with you. Well, OK, that's all we have time for today. And we've been speaking to Murray Lee of Dreamview Estates. And first and foremost, Murray, thank you so much for taking the time My and pleasure. to thank talk to us. Thank you for inviting us. me. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure. It's been refreshing. Um, I think we've got another video that we're planning to shoot in a, in a month or so's I time, gather, haven't yes. we? I'm looking forward to hearing exactly what the content of that is, but yes, it sounds well, interesting. We can curtain call that because we're interested in the impact of the pandemic in regenerating high streets or in reinventing high streets, okay. and you very kindly offered to walk us around your neighbourhood, sure. as it were.
Pleasure. Not only to look at the high street, but also to look at some of the properties in Golders Green and, and, and discuss the issues around sure. that. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing that because I, I can Me quite too. imagine that's going to be, uh, provided we get decent weather, yes, quite a pleasant great. day out. You do realise we'll be going by every single board that I've got up. That will be the route. Well, that yes. <laughs> we shall uh, make, make sure that we plan the route accordingly. <laughs> oh, thanks again, Murray. Pleasure. And uh, nice to meet you as well. And you. Thank and you. Before we go, just to remind you, I've been David Hanna. This is Cornerstone Tax, coffee and property. If you've got a question about stamp duty on a current or a past transaction, feel free to contact us. We put links to Dreamview Estates and to Cornerstone Tax and SDLT in the, re in the links below. And before you leave, don't forget to click like and subscribe to receive further updates and more editions of Coffee and Property. Thank you for watching.